stories from Africa, the United States and Hong Kong, that and much more coming up next. Hello, I'm Gary Krauss, and welcome to Mission 360, coming to you today from the bustling metropolis of Hong Kong. I'm standing in a very special place. Beside me is the grave, the tomb of Abram LaRue. Abram LaRue was a Seventh-day Adventist layperson who came to faith later in life, and he had a burden to take the good news of Jesus Christ and the Seventh-day Adventist message to the people of Asia. At around age 65, he contacted the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists and told the leaders of his desire, his passion. But they replied that unfortunately they didn't have the money and besides that, well, he was a bit too old. But nothing was to stand in the way of Abram Maru. He was a man of resources. He had had quite a history as a gold miner, as a woodcutter, as a shepherd, as a sailor. And he went back to his old trade and he got on a boat to Honolulu. There he worked for a while and then he worked his way across to Hong Kong where he landed in 1888. And for more than a decade he worked here mainly sharing literature. In 1891 he had printed the first tracts in the Chinese language. He ministered to sailors, he ministered to different people, and in 1902, Pastor Anderson and his family came and the first people were baptized and joined the Seventh-day Adventist Church right here in Hong Kong. And it was these beginnings with, with Abram LaRue that started the work that of course then uh, continued on into mainland China. And it's a privilege to stand here to remember the importance of this man who dedicated his life to mission because he never went home. He never went home. Well, we have a lot more about mission in this region of the world coming up, but first up, let's meet a global mission pioneer in Botswana. I'm here as an Adventist global mission pioneer and I've been here for six months. The village is quite interesting to work in. When I first came to this village, we had five regular members, uh, but it's, uh, the population is estimated to be above 18,000. At first I was a bit discouraged because I was from an atmosphere where you would fellowship with more than 50 people, where the worship services would be vibrant, and to come and find five people who couldn't even sing was the main challenge. And uh, We embarked on the House to House project, House to House visitation, where we share with people the love of, of, of Jesus, and the Lord has been so good. Uh, to begin with, we now have more than 80 people who are regular in attendance. Every Sabbath we have on, over, on, on average 10 or more visitors and uh, we have been having baptisms on a monthly basis. Uh, the, the first initiative that we took was the Papras one for prayer where we intensified our prayer life, where we would go to a village, to a home, instead of maybe studying with them, we start to pray for them. We have encountered people who have been so sick, and after praying for them, we saw them being healed instantly. I asked my Lord, where does he want me to, to save him? I made a covenant with, with the Lord I said, if, 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 if what I did pleases you, Lord, 
you will find me something to do which will uplift your name. To me, to be a global mission pioneer is a humbling experience, if I may use that word. One of the things that I want to see accomplished is to have the gospel permeate this village and the surrounding areas. Uh, to have people living in harmony with the principles laid down in the Bible. Those are basic uh, priorities that I want to see achieved and accomplished in this village. My guest is Pastor Jeff Scoggins, who is the new planning director for the Office of Adventist Mission here at the General Conference. Jeff, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Now, Jeff, when I first met you, you were actually working at the Adventist Board Headquarters. What were you doing there? Beginning when? When I was there. <laughs> <laughs> when I came out of college, I was in ADRA, in North American Division, and then uh, about 1998, maybe, uh, you, actually it was Mike, I guess it was, invited me and you to uh, do communication for Global Mission. Right, so, so that's where we work together. but. It wasn't too long after that that you were invited to go to Moscow to work in the Euro-Asia region of the world. What were you called to do there? I was called to be the field secretary for strategic planning and global mission. Okay, so you had been talking about global mission, you'd been promoting global mission, you'd been doing brochures and everything about now you're actually going into the field to be involved in it. That was it. So what did you do? <laughs> When I got there, um, we walked into, not the same day, but very soon thereafter, walked into ADCOM, and they said, let us tell you what we want you to do, which I thought I knew what I was supposed to do. Turns out I didn't. They said in the next two years, which was my term there, the next two years we want to plant 300 new churches, house churches through the former Soviet republics. Can you raise $4 million to do that? And I don't know what I was thinking, but I was inspired and I said, sure. <laughs> Is that all? <laughs> Is that it? Yeah, exactly. Uh, I got a reality check when the, when the first donation came in for $10,000 and my wife so kindly said, do that several hundred more times and you'll have it. And that's when the amount of money just hit me of what it really was. Yeah. And well, you prayed through it and you worked through it and there's actually a, a book published full of wonderful stories from that project. Yeah. Because how many churches were planted? 311, if I'm not mistaken, when, by the time we were done, yeah. And these were planted by whom? Global Mission Pioneers. We brought in 300 young men, really, from all of the, the, those places where they were going to be planted. We brought them in from local places and trained them at the seminary uh, Zaugski for three months and then we sent them out into the field. We went and we purchased very cheap houses for them to live in which they also used as a church. Wonderful. Um, and so yeah it was it turned out to be quite the quite the project. It's people still talk about it and it's 15 years later. Right and I was just talking to someone the other day and hundreds of those churches are still operating. They still are. In fact, I was a little worried about it because I had been out of touch for quite a while after leaving there. And uh, they, I asked somebody just recently, how many are still going? And the guy that I worked with closely, Ivan Ostrovsky, he said at least 60% are still going strong. Others are still um, struggling. Some of them had to be sold or whatever, which is fine. That's the process. He said some of the young men that we brought in are now conference presidents. <laughs> That's wonderful. Yeah. Isn't it? So Jeff, um, share a story from one of the pioneers, one of their experiences in this project. Uh, one of my favorite stories uh, is about a young man named Andre. And I'm not going to tell you where he was working at because for all I know, he's still working there and it's a closed country right now. Um, but uh, he came out of a life of crime. He was in big time in organized crime. And I have to shorten the story. I make this a sermon because it's a, it's a long and it's a great story. But it turned out that he, somebody handed him a Bible and he discovered not only Jesus, but he discovered the Sabbath in the Bible. He had never heard of a Seventh-day Adventist in his life. He was on death row 
through a series of miracles, he was released after being tested on the Sabbath and all sorts of things. I mean, he was going to be killed by the prison warden uh, due to his beliefs. And uh, he stayed staunchly with them, even though he had no training, nothing like that. Um, he had been miraculously preserved in the uranium mines. People didn't live there. That was a death sentence in of its own. Mm. He got out of prison and he went to find out if there was any other people that kept the Sabbath, that discovered the Seventh-day Adventists. And when I met him, he was planting a church in this country for a Seventh-day Adventist church. And he was there with a bunch of other pioneers that we were talking about. And they were talking about how difficult it was and how, how they were afraid of the the local authorities and things like this. And I was watching this young man, Andre, and he was just down there shaking his head. And I knew what he was thinking because this guy was fearless after what he had been through. And, <laughs> and, and I even asked him, uh, I said, can I share your story? I said, will it get you in trouble? And he said, I don't care if it gets me in trouble. <laughs> I still don't do it for his sake. But uh, it was, he was just an inspiring story of what God could do even without the infrastructure that, you know, maybe could have come and baptized him or something like that. He, he worked through him and he was planting churches. Amazing story. Yeah, and so throughout the former Soviet Union, these lighthouses were established in areas where there were no Adventist congregations. Correct. So why is church planting, like you were involved in there in um, the former Soviet Union, why is that so important? because it's what's pushing us out into the frontiers of mission. Uh, we don't want to be here much longer if we can do anything about it. And the thing is, is that Jesus gave us the ability to do something about it. He said, go tell the world. And when we tell the world, he can come back. What we're doing is we're not just planting churches. We're planting churches in areas where there are not currently Seventh-day Adventists. And uh, so that is our mandate. We're doing what Jesus told us to do. That's why it's so important. Fantastic, excuse me, fantastic. And that's why you're our new planning director. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> so friends at home, please remember to pray for Global Mission Pioneers. Pray for Global Mission Initiatives to reach into new and challenging areas and people groups. And to find out more information about church planting and global mission and how you can support through your prayers and your finances, go to AdventistMission.org. <laughs>in the late uh, 49, uh, basically early 50s, we only had 20,000, 21,000 members. But in the 80s, when we started getting reports, we had over 200,000 members. So as you were looking across- Yes, uh, God that, was still working. Uh, he was still working in his special way. And since that time, as China has opened up and uh, religious freedom has blossomed more, uh, we have now taken our membership over 400,000. In fact, 428,000, we praise the Lord. Yeah. You know, in addition to the blessing that the Holy Spirit provides yeah. to make that happen, uh, what do you see as the uh, key values and the, and the key uh, components of having that growth take place? Well, I think that what you see clearly, especially from those years of persecution and difficulty, even up until now, is strong member involvement. Okay. This is, this is a lay-led church. Out of 428,000 members, Elder Ryan, we only have about 140 ordained ministers. Okay. okay, wow. Only 140, and then we have all of these other lay ministers that are working and leading the church all across China. So number one, I would say lay involvement. And number two is just a deep love for Jesus. They can't help but share 
Christ. Now, you know, I, I also um, know that uh, there are many programs that we actually partner mm -hmm. with the government on. Mm -hmm. uh, they give us permission to print books and mm -hmm. they're supportive of that. And uh, uh, what are some of the ministries that we see uh, taking place in China that bring hope to people? Well, you know, you're right. The government is looking for churches to participate in serving the needs of the community. I just heard just last week of a, of a new church plant in one of uh, the provinces in China that has developed a relationship with an orphanage. And their members go in there every week to spend time. And these are orphans that have special needs. And they are ministering to those people in that way. The government, which is, run, by the way, the orphanage is run by the government, is delighted to have this church come in. We have other ministries like that going on to lepers, for example, and to other special needs. The fact is, the more our membership gets involved in the community, the more relevant they are. Well, it's actually uh, really the ministry of Jesus. It is, yeah. Uh, it's, it's the method that Christ used. He That's actually right. touched people's lives, That's right. spent much more time healing than he ever did preaching. Oh, he did. Many of our churches are doing health expos. They are teaching health principles. Many of our churches have what they call health centers, but what they are are lifestyle centers, and they invite people with terminal disease and lifestyle diseases to come in, and wonderful things happen physically, but more so spiritually. Hundreds of, and I'm not just exaggerating, sure. hundreds of people come to know Jesus and uh, join this church. Well, I, I have been, uh, was surprised today to hear of the almost like uh, sanitarium type yes. uh, institutions that are operating in China by local churches. That's they're, right. they're the ones implementing That's them. And these are not small enterprises. Lots of people come and I was surprised when I visited them when they have their, their morning instruction or their class time, they start out with a strong devotional message. They then talk about Jesus. They talk about the power of God to help them overcome certain habits. They're open with morning and evening devotionals. Let me just put it that way, worship. These are non-Christian people, atheists. Some of them are even government officials. Well, you know, uh, we have talked about the various uh, ministries that are taking place in China, the things that uh, our members are involved in that make this growth take place. But uh, we cannot sidestep the question of the challenge. Yes. Uh, the challenge is there. I mean, uh, uh, China is now 1.4 1, 1. 1. billion. 1.4 billion people. Yeah. And I know that there are cities uh, probably scattered throughout China in which uh, probably Christianity in general has just yeah. made a beginning, if anything. That is exactly right. Entire provinces. You and I have been talking recently. We have a province where we don't even have one single member. And the Christian presence as a, as, as a body is very, very scarce. There are millions upon millions of people in large cities in China that ye have yet to hear that they can go to bed at night at peace, knowing that Jesus loves them. We have one city, Elder Ryan, that has 30 million people. That's more people in that one municipality than all the states in the United States except for California. Okay. And we only have 200 members or so okay. in that huge city. I don't want us to get by the time here without this yes. question. You know, uh, there are many people watching this from around the world. This is the Adventist Mission video. And, uh, you know, when you talk about these unentered cities and these, these multiple millions of people that haven't had the message, what role does the rest of the membership play well, in bringing that hope to them? Well, you know what, I appreciate that question because I believe the most important role is please pray for China. There is power in prayer. This is a god side task. Pray for China. Number two, I, I like that expression, a God-sized task. That's exactly yeah, right. Just be sure you remember that. A God-sized task. It is. It's way beyond our, our ability even to comprehend. So we need to pray. And secondly, please and, and support global missions. It is through Adventist missions, those funds that you give come to help us put pioneer missionaries in unentered cities. They speak the language. They know the culture and they're trained by our local members, uh, there's a lot we can do. And but that's funding that is on top of the mission offering in time. Exactly, yeah. yes. That, that's what That's exactly right. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, thank you. Yeah, and I'm sure you'd want to thank the people. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Our, our yeah. greatest thanks go to them. Yeah. We feel supported. In fact, uh, one of the Chinese pastors just recently said, we feel humbled that there's so much love and support around the world for our church here. Thank you, Elder Falkenberg, for being our guest today. Now we're going to go to Rwanda and South Sudan for further stories.
Africa, beautiful landscapes with unique cultures and teeming with history. Home to more than one billion people, the African continent is rich with mission opportunities. Here, you find some of the most picturesque scenery on earth, as well as loving people who are full of joy. Unfortunately, this beauty has been marred time and again by war and violence. Despite the problems, there are more than 7 million Seventh-day Adventists and three World Division offices here. One of the divisions is the East Central Africa Division, and this is our focus this quarter. This territory is made up of 11 countries and more than 11,000 churches. Four of the countries are in the 1040 window, a region considered to be the most unreached area of the world. In countries like the Democratic Republic of Congo, Burundi, Eritrea, Rwanda, and Somalia, war and violence have taken a heavy toll, impacting thousands of lives. In Rwanda, tribal genocide affected church members, left buildings in ruin, and scattered families. But the resilience of this faithful people is helping to make strides towards a strong church. The church in Rwanda has more than half a million members and is well respected in the community. Rwandans are required to perform community service on the last Saturday of each month, but the government makes an exception for Adventist members to perform these duties on Sunday instead to accommodate Sabbath observance. In the country of South Sudan, there has also been war, and sadly, fighting is still going on. But in spite of these problems, God is working here. There are 59 Adventist churches with approximately 24,000 members, and more and more people are becoming Adventists every year in South Sudan. This Sabbath, church members from all over Juba are joining together in worship. They celebrate growth in their territory. God is richly blessing the dedicated work of this faithful family. Juba is the capital city where Adventists operate a school, a clinic, and among other entities, an Adventist radio station. There are approximately 900 students at the school here, but not enough classrooms to accommodate them. Students sit tightly together as they share a desk, and some have to sit on the floor as they write with notebooks on their laps. The children pay little attention to these inconveniences. They are eager to learn and are very respectful towards their teachers and faculty. There are many plans for growth in the East Central Africa Division. Please pray for local leadership and for church members as they are actively involved in reaching their world for Jesus. Well, I hope that you've enjoyed today's 360 degree of mission around the world. And I hope that you've been inspired and challenged by what you've seen and heard. From more rural areas in Africa through to high density, highly populated cities such as Hong Kong, men and women are sharing the light of God's love in very practical ways. And I want to thank you for your continuing support for mission, through your prayers, through your personal involvement, and through your giving it does make a tremendous difference. And I want to remind you of our companion magazine, our Mission 360 magazine that's full of stories, just like you see here on this program. It's full of stories, full of pictures, full of inspiration to keep you on the front lines of what's happening in mission around the world. And if you'd like to get a hard copy of this magazine, I'd be happy to send that to you. But if you look at the information on your screen, you can see how easy it is to download the magazine onto your digital tablet so that you can read it in the comfort of your own home as you're traveling, you can share it with others, or you can just view it on the internet at AdventistMission.org. Well, for Adventist Mission, I'm Gary Krause, and I hope that you can join me next time right here on Mission 360.